I want to start by making one thing absolutely clear, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's a point with which I am sure every member of this House agrees. The dangerous channel crossings must be stopped. These extremely perilous journeys have tragically led to lives being lost, and the only people who benefit from this trade in human misery are the criminal smuggler gangs and people traffickers, who are laughing all the way to the bank at this government's failure to arrest and prosecute them. Labour has a comprehensive and workable five-point plan which will defeat the people smugglers and fix our broken asylum system. Our plan is expressed through the amendments and new clauses that we have tabled to this Bill, and I will speak to these in due course. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, members opposite, opposite repeatedly state that they wish to stop the dangerous channel crossings, but the fact is that they are completely and utterly failing to do so. Every single measure that Ministers announce turns out to either be an expensive and unworkable headline-chasing gimmick or a policy that succeeds only in making things worse, or indeed both. And in the case of this legislative sham that we're debating today, this bigger backlog bill, it is definitely both. Madam Deputy Speaker, under the Conservatives, the channel crossings have skyrocketed from 299 in 2018 to 46,000 in 2022. And throughout this period, ministers have subjected the country to a seemingly endless stream of nonsensical proposals, which have all been given pride of place on the front pages of the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph, only to be swiftly consigned to the dustbin of history where they belong. Madam Deputy Speaker, in order for a deterrent to be effective, it has to be credible. And of course, your credibility is severely diminished every time you fail to follow through on a commitment that you've made. So let's take a quick canter through some of the posturing and empty threats that this shambles of a government has made over the last few years. They told us that the British Coast Guard would be instructed to push back dinghies in the Channel, which would have breached the law of the sea and potentially led to further deaths of refugees and innocent children. Then they said they were going to build a giant wave machine in the English Channel. I mean, I don't know where you'd find a wave machine round here, given that the Conservatives have closed down most of England's swimming pools, although I suppose it's possible the Prime Minister might have a spare one back at his place. And then they said they were going to fly asylum seekers to Ascension Island, 4,000 miles away, and they even fantasised about sending them to Papua New Guinea, which is literally on the other side of the planet. And that brings us to their latest cunning plan. They went to Kigali and they paid £140 million for a press release. And 12 months later, they have managed to send more Home Secretaries to Rwanda than they have asylum seekers. Madam Deputy Speaker, you'd, you could be forgiven for finding all of this quite comical. But the fact is that it's deadly serious because a vast amount of taxpayers' money is being squandered on a profoundly unethical policy that is designed to fail on its own terms. Because even if the Rwanda scheme does get up and running, which the government admits is unlikely to happen until at least March 2024, the Rwandan government has refused to commit to taking more than around 1 or 2 per cent of the those who arrive here on small boats. We're talking hundreds of removals rather than the thousands per year that might have a chance of deterring asylum seekers from crossing the channel. So it will fail to stop the small boat channel crossings because if you've experienced personal tragedy, fought your way across continents and handed your life savings to a people smuggler so that you can endanger your own life crossing the channel, then a 1% chance of being sent to Rwanda is simply not going to represent a level of risk that you might be averse to. I will give way. On the point of the Rwanda scheme, apart from paying £150 million for maybe deporting 200 people, we also, under the, under the agreement, have to take people back from Rwanda as well. Well, my honourable friend has made a very important point, which I would also um, use as a, um, as a prompt to talk about the Israel scheme. So, of course, Israel and Rwanda uh, did a deal. What happened with that scheme? Every single one of the people that were sent from Israel to Rwanda had left Rwanda within a matter of weeks and were on their way back to Europe. 
So uh, it's a very expensive way of giving people a round trip, and I would not recommend it as a deterrent. And then just to add to the general sense that the government has lost the plot, we had the bizarre and frankly appalling spectacle of the Home Secretary jetting down to Rwanda with a carefully vetted gaggle of journalists in order to indulge in a photo shoot that was akin to a Visit Rwanda tourist promo. Now, I may have missed something, Madam Deputy Speaker, but I thought the idea was to deter the Channel crossings by using Rwanda as a threat. I'm not quite sure how that tallies with the Home Secretary likening Kigali to the Garden of Eden. One minute, Rwanda is the perfect place imaginable to rebuild your life. The next, the threat of getting sent there is being deployed as a deterrent. It's a truly farcical state of affairs, but it's also of central importance to what we're debating today, because the entire bill is predicated on the government being able to remove those who arrive here on small boats to a safe third country. And right now, Rwanda is the only safe third country they've got. So the fact that the Rwanda plan is unworkable, unaffordable and unethical renders this entire bill unworkable, unaffordable and unethical. Because this was an issue he raised before, and I raised at the earlier stages of the bill. When the Home Affairs Select Committee went to Calais in January and we met all the people involved uh, in patrolling the beaches and the local officials, they told us that when the Rwanda scheme was announced, there was a surge in migrants approaching the French authorities because they didn't want to end up on a plane to Rwanda about staying in France. So there was a deterrent effect. The trouble is it hasn't actually started yet, but if it did, it would have an impact, and that's the point. Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his intervention. I'm not sure I follow the logic of it, because he said there was a deterrent effect, but it hasn't started yet, which suggests to me that there has not been a deterrent effect. And if we look at the numbers, the the channel crossings continue to skyrocket. So I think what matters to this House is results and outcomes, and as things stand, there is no evidence whatsoever that it has acted as a deterrent. Madam Deputy Speaker, this bigger backlog bill is rotten to its very core, because it prevents the Home Secretary from considering those who arrive here on small boats as asylum seekers, and instead obliges her to detain and remove them. But there's nowhere to detain them and there's nowhere to remove them to either. We already have 50,000 asylum seekers in around 400 hotels, costing the taxpayer an eye-watering £6 million every single day. And on average, each asylum seeker is waiting a staggering 450 days for a decision. The backlog now stands at 166,000, more than eight times larger than when Labour left office in 2010 when it it stood at just under 19,000. And incidentally, I'm still waiting for the Prime Minister and the Minister opposite to (coughs) apologise to the House and correct the record on that point. I'm very grateful for um, the Honourable Member giving way. He mentioned detention, and there are a number of amendments that that have been tabled for today's uh, report stage around detention. I listened carefully to what the Minister said about unaccompanied children and detaining them. But I also uh, wanted to ask my honourable friend his views about detaining children, families with children and pregnant women. This House has made very clear in the past its view about safeguards being required for detention of vulnerable groups, as I've just described. Does does my honourable friend think that we need to think again now about pregnant women and children with families and detention? Well, I thank my honourable friend for for that excellent intervention. I I think she's absolutely right to highlight this issue, and she has tabled a compelling amendment uh, on this issue. She's aware that members on both sides fought very hard for these legal limits, as she rightly pointed out. And, you know, when we're talking about the detention of pregnant women, I think removing those limits now and paving the way for vulnerable uh, individuals to be detained individually, it's, it's, it's morally wrong, it's wrong-headed, it's deeply counterproductive, uh, and I have not heard any argument to justify it from ministers. Now new figures reveal that this bigger backlog bill could end up putting an extra 50,000 people into permanent taxpayer-funded accommodation this year, with hotel costs rising to over £13 million a day, 
which is over £4 billion a year during a cost of living crisis. And this is because, according to the government's own forecasts, 53,000 who cross on small boats will be classed as inadmissible, without any prospect of being removed. And what's particularly astonishing is that they made this same mistake last year by including similar inadmissibility provisions in the Nationality and Borders Act. The result, a cost of £400 million to the taxpayer in just six months, with only 21 people returned to their country of origin. Madam Deputy Speaker, this bungling government just keeps doubling down on its own incompetence. The more posturing they do, the more small boats we see. The longer they govern, the longer the asylum backlog grows. And the more our constituents will ask themselves, with record high immigration figures and a record high asylum backlog, are our borders more or less secure under the Tories? I thank my friend for giving way. I completely understand why the Minister did not want to give way despite saying that he would do on this particular issue, but he raises the question of people being in hotels. Does he also agree with me that this government needs to be honest with its own backbenchers about the statutory instrument it tried to slip out at the end of the last session that will remove the licensing laws from places for houses of multiple occupancy for asylum seekers that will presumably prevent their local authorities from refusing to license those places. It will also have the consequence of meaning that we no longer require places where we're expecting families and pregnant women and small children to live to have fire alarms or smoke alarms or indeed running water. Does he agree with me this government needs to be honest about how awful it wishes to treat asylum seekers and how it's going to avoid local authorities being part of that conversation? Well, I, I thank my honourable friend for that powerful intervention and, and she's absolutely right. We're talking here about basic standards of decency and humanity and houses of multiple occupancy need to be properly regulated. They need a basic uh, flaw in terms of uh, certification, registration, uh, safety, health and safety and particularly when we're, looking, we're talking here about families. Um, so it's, she, she's absolutely right and I do think that the the government would um, really should consider being more transparent and straightforward on, on that point. Fortunately, we on these benches are, do care about secure borders, and we will clear up the mess by delivering a firm, fair and well-managed system that will stop the dangerous channel crossings. Because we know that good government is not about chasing headlines, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's about common sense, hard graft, and quiet diplomacy. And these are the qualities that underpin our new clauses and amendments to this bill. Michelle Minister for giving way. Um, I, I interviewed a Michelle Minister at um, a committee stage and I found out that apparently there is a cap, uh, or the Labour Party support a cap for safe and legal routes, which was news to me at the time. Has the Shadow Minister had any time to think about what that cap level would be? But also, bearing in mind how many people would like to try and get to our country, no, what the approach would be to those who had failed in their application but had still travelled here illegally and got here? Would the Labour po uh, any future potential Labour government be open to deporting those individuals? Yeah. Well, the, the cap has to be determined in consultation with local authorities and with Parliament. Uh, that is absolutely right. Uh, in terms of removals, of course, what you need is a processing system that actually works so that you can get to a decision and people who are from safe countries that should be removed, they need to be swiftly removed from our country. And those that are genuine asylum seekers should be granted leave to remain so that they can get on, on with their lives and we can start to clear up the abject mess that this government has made of our asylum system. The first part of our five-point plan is to repurpose the funds that are currently being wasted on the Money for Nothing Rwanda plan and to redirect those funds into a new elite cross-border 100-strong police force that will relentlessly pursue the ruthless criminal smuggling gangs upstream. The latest £500 million payment that the British government has made to the French government will be having some effect on reducing the crossings, but the reality is that we will not succeed if we're focusing all our efforts on the hundreds of kilometres of French coastline where resources are bound to be spread very thin. We also need sophisticated operations with the British authorities working with EU member states, Europol, Interpol and Frontex to tackle the gangs upstream. Our new Clause 16 therefore instructs the Government to lay before Parliament a framework for a 12-month pilot cooperation agreement with those governments and agencies 
that can do just that in order to secure the prosecution and conviction of persons involved in facilitating illegal entry to the United Kingdom from neighbouring countries. Turning to new clause 16, this also incorporates the uh, uh, excuse me, new clause 16, which I was talking to, uh, also incorporates the second part of our plan, securing a returns agreement with the European Union. This is essential. Since the party opposite botched the Brexit negotiations and Britain left the Dublin Convention, which had provided agreements on returns, the number of channel crossings has gone up by an astonishing 2,400 per cent. For every one person crossing the channel in a small boat in 2019, 24 cross now. Madam Deputy Speaker, there are three vitally important points to make with regards to getting a returns deal. First, international challenges require international solutions. Second, we need an agreement with our nearest neighbours, which must include returns. And third, we will only strike a returns deal with the European Union if we bring something into the negotiation. And that should include a proper plan for capped safe and legal routes for bona fide asylum seekers located in mainland Europe. We suggest that Britain prioritises unaccompanied children with family in the UK, and our new clause 14 reflects this. So, I, th I think the Honourable Gentleman was first. I will come to the Honourable Gentleman. I, I just would uh, like the Honourable Gentleman to reflect on the fact that when President Macron made his assertions about returns back to France, actually the European Union the following day said they weren't going to countenance any such proposals. They just simply do not agree for returns. And furthermore, of course, France itself is not a place where people would associate with uh, persecution or threats or irreversible harm. So what, what is his, his argument all about? This is about a negotiation. We clearly have to do a returns deal. It's an important part of the deterrent effect. You don't get a returns deal unless you have uh, something on the table. And that's where we believe there should be a clear link between uh, policies on safe and legal routes uh, as a way of, of getting a clear position uh, in terms of negotiations with uh, the European Union. The reality is that this is the only deterrent effect that really is going to work. You, you're dealing with people that have risked their lives, come, have fought their way across Europe, are prepared to spend their life savings on paying people smugglers to cross the channel. It, you're not going to deter them unless they know that there's a returns deal in place. And that's one of the reasons why the Dublin Convention worked. It acted as a deterrent. The reason that the, what, how else can you explain that the numbers have gone through the roof since we left the Dublin Convention? It's simple. I'm grateful because this is just nonsense. In the last year that we were covered by the Dublin Convention, before the pandemic struck, we applied to the EU for 8,500 returns under that returns agreement. Only 105 were granted, 1.2 per cent. So this is completely nonsense. It didn't work when we were in the EU, and he's now expecting to magic out some agreement, which they're not going to give us anyway. So stop misleading the House about those figures. I, I, I find this response bizarre, because there's, there's some very simple facts, which are we left the Dublin Convention, and since we left the Dublin Convention, the number of small boat crossings have gone through the roof. It's not rocket science, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a simple fact of mathematics. And, and the point is that you cannot solve an international problem without international cooperation. You have to recognise that there is a flow of asylum seekers coming across the European Union. The idea that we just say to the EU, you can take them all and we're not going to take any, is for the birds. It is fantasy politics. And I'm just quite stunned that members opposite don't seem to understand that very simple political fact. Oh, well. Actually, I remember, if, 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 if the right honourable member from Maidenhead doesn't mind me mentioning her, when she, when she was Prime Minister, the first letter that she wrote in trying to trigger Article 50 to the European Union said that we wanted to have an, a, a security treaty with the European Union. 
That's what I would dearly love us to have. I think it's one of the great flaws out of how we've left the European Union that we haven't ended up with that. Surely this should be part of that security treaty so that we have better relations with Interpol, with Europol, with Frontex, with all the, and we have proper sharing of information so that anybody who is arriving in the UK, we know all their details. Isn't that where we need to go? The, the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right. Uh, we know from our long uh, period of being in the European Union that in order to get a deal with the European Union, you, it has to be a quid pro quo. There has to be a negotiation based on a grown-up conversation about the challenge that you need to tackle and how to tackle it. And a, and a security, a, a, an in, all-encompassing security agreement could be a very good way to open that door because, of course, the European Union knows that the United Kingdom is a very important security partner for all sorts of reasons. So I agree with him entirely on that very strategic point that he's made. So while we support Government New Clause 8 on safe and legal routes, we believe that it should be linked to securing a returns deal with the European Union. And as I said, our approach is based on hard graft, common sense and quiet diplomacy, and we would urge the Government to start thinking and acting in the same vein. Our third commitment is that Labour will fix the problems with current resettlement programmes. This includes the broken Afghan schemes, and our New Clause 21 instructs the Government to report every three months on progress or lack of in meeting its own target in terms of supporting those loyal to Britain Afghans who sacrifice so much to protect our service people and to stand up for our liberal values in Afghanistan. All resettlement routes need to of course be properly controlled and managed and they therefore cannot be unlimited but they do also need to work. Fourthly, Labour's long-term international development strategy will include tackling the root causes of migration upstream through increased humanitarian assistance and greater emphasis on conflict prevention and resolution programmes. This is slightly beyond the focus of this bill, but an important aspect of migration policy and a lesson that needs to be learned from Afghanistan in relation to Sudan, of course, which was mentioned earlier on. Early on. If you cut aid and you cut the right kind of aid, you will end up increasing uh, the challenges around the dangerous uh, channel crossings and you hurt British <coughs> values and interests. Excuse me. Our comprehensive plan will also fix what is perhaps the Conservatives' most astonishing failure of basic governance, the failure to clear the backlog. It's truly staggering that just 13% of small boat asylum claims are being processed within five years. And it's deeply troubling that while around half of the huge 166,000 backlog is down to small boat crossings, another 80,000 has built up organically under the Conservatives since 2010. This is no coincidence. Home Office decision-making has collapsed. In 2013, the Conservatives downgraded asylum decision-makers to junior staff, hired, literally going from a Saturday job one minute to making life-or-death decisions the next. No wonder this resulted in worse decisions often overturned on appeal, and it's deeply troubling that the staff attrition rate in 2022 in these teams stood at an astonishing 46%. And there is little prospect of improvement, Madam Deputy Speaker, given, home, given that Home Office statistics published on Monday show that this year the number of decision-makers has actually decreased. So let's be clear. The incompetence and indifference of consecutive Home Secretaries since 2010 that have brought the basic functions of government to a grinding halt. And during this cost of living crisis, the British taxpayer is paying the price. Our new Clause 10 therefore sets out how the government should get on with expediting asylum processing for the countries that are listing, listed in the schedule of this bill. If an applicant has no right to asylum in the UK, they should be removed safely and swiftly to the safe country from which they have come, such as Albania. Further to New Clause 10, our New Clause 13 instructs the Home Secretary to publish a report every three months on the progress that she's making on clearing the backlog. The backlog crisis is every... Oh. I'm sorry to interrupt the Shadow Minister's flow, um, and I wholeheartedly support him, as we have time and time again with regard to the criticisms of the Government's lack of processing of cases, including the lack of staffing resources. On new clause 10, where the proposal is for an expedited asylum process, could he reassure me that there will be no lessening of the legal rights of asylum seekers, no lessening of access to legal representation, 
and no lessening of the application of international human rights treaties and conventions under this process. I thank my honourable friend for that intervention and absolutely uh, the, the proposal is that there are a number of countries which have very low grant rates and that must therefore be where we triage and put them into a category where the processing can be expedited. However, all of the processing must be done on an individual case-by-case -case basis in line with our uh, treaty obligations. You cannot have block definitions of any particular category of asylum seeker and, and of course that's one of the main issues around the legality of this bill. Uh, and that includes access to legal aid. So I can absolutely re reassure him on that point. We have to get the balance right between the efficiency and effectiveness of dealing with the backlog. Uh, that has to be based on triaging, on giving much more support and upgrading the staff in the Home Office. But it must also be, excuse me, Madam Speaker, it must also be underpinned uh, by the provisions that he refers to. Um, and of course, the, the, the return on investment for improving the quality of decision making uh, uh, would be uh, rapid and substantial, because quicker processing means fewer asylum seekers in hotels. Which brings me to our amendments on accommodation for asylum seekers. Bad decisions on the location of accommodation means that the process then slows down due to legal challenges, and the whole system gets even more clogged up. It would be far better to consult local authorities early in the process, and our new Clause 9 instructs the Government to do just that. I was rather disappointed by the fact that the Foreign Secretary and the Honourable Member for Dorset, among others, failed to join us in the division lobbies during committee stage when we voted for this equivalent clause. I'm, a, I'm aware that they have pushed back against ham-fisted ministers trying to steamroller them on this matter, and I also know that they've sided with their local Conservative councils against their own government. But they are certainly not the only members on the benches opposite who have urged the Home Office to do better on this point. And of course, all accommodation must be value for money, as our new Clause 11 indicated, indicates. We can't keep having private companies making these huge markups at the expense of the taxpayer. I think, I think the Shadow Minister for giving way. Um, just say, for instance, this quiet diplomacy wasn't as successful as he hoped, <laughs> and actually a lot of his returns agreements didn't actually materialise, and actually all of these people who did a arrive just here illegally thing, actually were green-lighted if the Labour government was ever in charge. Would there ever at any point be any, po any policy whatsoever to deport to a safe third country? Well, uh, as I've just pointed out, we're proposing, for example, a fast track for people from safe countries. We absolutely are of the view that people whose asylum uh, claims are not uh, successful or legitimate should be as rapidly and safely uh, sent back to their country of origin. So um, I, I hope I've understood the, uh, the point the Honourable Gentleman was making. I'm not quite sure what it was. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, honourable and right honourable members on both sides of the House have raised concerns about the way in which this bill will undermine our ability to crack down on modern slavery. And we do have to ask why it is that the Prime Minister has taken the attitude towards trafficked women and young girls being sold as sex slaves and so accommodating to terrorists and criminals on the other hand. You just need to look at his tweet of the 7th of March, threatening victims of modern slavery with deportation. It was disgraceful, and now his government's amendments 114 to 116 have made it even harder for victims to come forward. It will be held up by, I'm afraid, the pimps and the traffickers to threaten their victims. Two former independent anti-slavery commissioners, Sarah Thornton and Kevin Highland, recently warned that this bill will devastate modern slavery protections, and it's a gift to criminals. All of us in this House know that this bill is a trafficker's charter. And then just look at the Prime Minister's shocking record on deporting foreign criminals. Astonishingly, 19 terror suspects are living in taxpayer-funded British hotels because the government has failed to remove them. Labour's new Clause 15 places a duty on the Secretary of State to remove suspected terrorists who've entered the country illegally or consider the imposition of terrorism prevention and investigation measures upon them. Deportations of criminals have fallen off a cliff since the Conservatives came to power in 2010. They plummeted by 66% to 5,000 a year before the pandemic and to just 2,100 in 2021. This is an insult to victims and it again proves what we all know. Labour is tough on crime and tough on the causes of crime, but under the Conservatives, criminals have never had it so good. 
Madam Deputy Speaker, the Minister for Immigration was appointed to his position as the moderate voice who would curb the more fanatical tendencies of his boss. But that simply has not happened. Instead, it appears that he's either been kidnapped by the hard right of his party or he's willingly hitched his wagon to them because he thinks that's the way the wind is blowing. But the Minister is not alone because his friend the Prime Minister also appears to have caved in to the Home Secretary and the Trumpian faction that she leads. He's caved in to her by adding of Government new clauses 22 and 26 to this bill, thereby completely torpedoing his own negotiations with the European Court of Human Rights. It really is quite extraordinary that Conservative Prime Ministers never seem to learn from the fate of their predecessors. The more you appease the extremists, the more they demand. Yeah. The Prime Minister is weak and he's been played. This weakness did for his predecessors and ultimately it will also do for him. But arguably the most shocking of this whole sorry tale, Madam Deputy Speaker, is this Conservative government's contempt for cash payer tax. Apart f aside from losing billions to fraudsters during the pandemic, dishing out overpriced contracts to their mates for unusable PPE and crashing the economy to the tune of £30 billion, the government's asylum policy stand out as a prime example of ministers scattering taxpayer money to the four winds and receiving absolutely nothing in return, chasing headlines whilst buying failure. There are so many vitally important questions to be answered. Why, for instance, has the government failed to publish an impact assessment? For example, do ministers have any idea of the increase in detention capacity that will be required because of this bill? The Home Secretary was completely unable to answer this simple question during her car crash of an interview on the radio this morning. And how much will these additional detention places cost? How much will the government pay Rwanda per asylum seeker? And how much will each flight cost? We still don't know the answer to that question one year after the £140 million was given. Our constituents deserve to know, as these decisions impact directly on their communities and on the state of our public finances. It's outrageous the government's not providing an iota of information about the impact of a bill with such huge financial and community impact implications. So we're bound to ask, Madam Deputy Speaker, what are they afraid of? If they truly believe that this bill is, it will succeed in achieving its objectives, then surely they would happily have published the impact assessment well before second reading, and they would have been delighted to stand at that dispatch box to defend it. But of course there is another possibility, Madam Deputy Speaker, which is that ministers have not even attempted to assess the impact of this bigger backlog bill because they're utterly terrified of what they would reveal if they did. They're terrified of seeing the cost of their own incompetence. They're horrified by the thought of being transparent because transparency reveals the truth. And the truth is that this bill will just make everything worse. It will boost the profits of the people smugglers. It will add tens of thousands to the backlog. It will add hundreds of millions to the hotel bills. It will tarnish British re Britain's reputation as a country that upholds the international rules-based order. It will further inflame community frustration and tension. And it will add to the desperate misery of those who are seeking sanctuary from persecution and violence. Now, many Honourable members on the benches opposite agree with every word of what I've just said, and I would urge them to support our new clauses and to join us in the no lobby when we vote against this deeply damaging and counterproductive bill this evening. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker.